welcome everybody to this event about gender equality in academia, links to sustainable medical research and education. My name is Siri Wangen. I'm the leader of the Norwegian Research Center for Women's Health. And today, together with Eva, Eva Gertz, I will be the session moderator. And thank you very much, Eva, for taking the initiative to this important event. Eva is also one of the keynote speakers today. Academic career in medicine remains a global challenge for women. Despite the fact that the majority of master and PhD students in medicine are women, women still hold a minority of senior and leading faculty position in this field. So time has come to increase the number of women in higher academic positions. And solid documentation shows vast knowledge gaps about women's health. And furthermore, limited teaching exists about women's health in Norwegian universities. The workshop today focuses about how promoting women into tenured positions at universities may lead to a larger focus on women's health in education and research, and how international and multidisciplinary collaboration is a tool in this regard. We have three speakers today, and our first speaker is Professor Saloma Mashwim, Cape Town University and Women in Global Health South Africa chapter. The title of her talk is Gender Diversity in Leading Public Health Universities. So please, Aloma, the word is yours. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you, especially for the invitation to give this talk. It's something that is really close to my heart, something I'm quite passionate about. And as you've mentioned, the title of my talk is Gender Diversity in Leading Health Universities. And the fundamental question I want to start off with is, you know, looking at these were words by Mahmoud Fatala, who's a professor uh, of, of obstetrics and gynecology, who said the question should not be why do women not accept the service we offer? But why do we not offer a service that women will accept? And I think this brings a good framework for, for what I'm going to talk about because we're looking at gender diversity, not just in healthcare, but in leadership as in health leadership, and ultimately decisions that are made at healthcare level impact on, on, on health outcomes. And when we don't make good decisions, we end up with a society that is not able to utilize some of the solutions that we have come up with as academics. So the fundamental concepts for me is one, gender diversity on its own. What are the benefits of that? Gender diversity in healthcare and then gender diversity in healthcare leadership because ultimately that's, that's what we really want to discuss. But you can't talk about healthcare leadership without talking about healthcare and, and, and diversity as a whole. So what, is, what, what views have, have the world taken on gender diversity? So there's the political angle where the argument is it's unfair and, and, and unequitable that females are underrepresented in leadership roles and, 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 and have unequal pay. And that's one way of looking at it. And that's more from you know, the social side of things, whereas the economic angle brings a gender balanced, gender balanced organizations are more productive. And I think it's combining the two of these, looking for equity, representation, and, and, and that the productivity of an, of an organization that is gender balanced and the advantages of that. Of course, even though we know all of these things and we agree on them, there is some gender fatigue. And, and, and whilst we haven't reached any of these targets, uh, there, is, you know, there is this fatigue about talking about these things. And, and continuing to fight over these. Even if you look at the number of publications uh, in some of the areas, you know, they are not going up. The, the, some of, in some of these discussions, things it's actually going down, even though we have not achieved uh, gender equity. So diversity in teams, the progress on that seems to be accelerating. Uh, we've got more balanced teams. I think the notion of having 50-50 teams 
that the, the and and even within medical schools you know there are more females within the team they as i come from a surgical discipline there are more females that are qualifying there are more females being trained in healthcare so that is happening much faster and that is more acceptable but what is happening in leadership a lot of medical organizations at university level, at, at dean level, I mean, if you start counting how many heads of departments you have that are female, you start seeing that there are fewer and fewer that are female. How many deans do you have that are female? They they get fewer and when you move up to how many vice chancellors do you have it's even it's even fewer so when we look at health leadership it's important to note that it's not just about creating diversity in teams but it's important to ensure that even as across lead, different leadership levels that there is diversity at leadership levels and that we should be aiming to have this 50 50 balance or even more across leadership levels and not just having diversity teams. So this touches on uh, SDG3, good health and well-being, as well as gender equality. And you can't look at one without thinking about the other. We all know about social determinants of health and equity is one of the things that, that leads to, to, to having ad, unequal adverse outcomes. If you look at diseases that are specific to women, looking at maternal mortality, myself being an obstetrician and gynecologist, you'll see that they, they, they are more preventable deaths that are related to, to conditions that affect women only than conditions that affect uh, both genders. So the equality issue needs to go hand in hand with achieving uh, the sustainable development goal on health and well-being. Also an important uh, comment from the Lancet Commission on Women and Health was women merit special attention because of their distinctive contribution to society, a contribution that is under-recognized and undervalued economically, socially, politically, and culturally. And so when we start to improve equity from, from a gender side of things, women, even healthcare will improve and acknowledging that women are contributing in many areas, including it economically and pol politically. It's important that we ensure that there's representation, not just at team level, but at leadership level as well. And so I've put this picture of the leaky pipeline to show that, you know, when it comes, if we're counting just the number of females that are being trained in healthcare, yes, the, rep the representation is much higher, but what happens? How many women are we training to become experts and leaders? Because ultimately decisions that will impact on our healthcare are being made by experts and leaders. And it's ensuring that women are represented and developed to become experts and leaders in healthcare. So some of you might be familiar with this notion. We work really hard, years of studying, years of, of hard work to break this glass ceiling. And when you break this glass ceiling, you know, sometimes women get put in positions where, where that become the end of, of, of their contribution. And so it's important that we create an enabling environment for women that are going to be leading and women that are leading that, you know, once you break the glass ceiling, you shouldn't be falling off the glass cliff. So in conclusion, these are a few solutions that, that I'm proposing. This is based on work that have people uh, have, a lot of many other people have done on this. We need to inspire and encourage younger women to be leaders, to become leaders and experts in, in the health field. We need to create gender parity targets. It's not enough to just say that we wish that there were more women or there was better representation. We need to set goals and the 50-50 is an example of, of a target that certain people that has been set by various organizations. Design transformation strategies. It's not enough to, to have a wish list that we want more gender diversity, but they has to be a strategy on how this is going to be achieved by each organization, create an inclusive culture so that women can thrive, identify top talent and acknowledge that top talent can be male, female, can be any, any race, you know, gender and being deliberate and looking for, for talented people and creating spaces for them to grow and occupy leadership position creating mentorships program, mentorship programs 
positions, life coaching for those who are in health positions of health leadership. And finally, ensuring that as, as when, when women become one clinicians, uh, getting involved in, in, in health, that they are developed into becoming experts and the same experts need to be pivoted to become leaders. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Salume, for this uh, very interesting and important talk. And then we go on to our second speaker, Eva Gertz, Professor of Cardiology, University of Bergen, and Director of Center for Research on Cardiac Disease in Women. The title of her talk is Sex Differences in Disease. Does it matter? Please, Eva. Thank you, Siri. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction. And also congratulations to Salome for a great kickoff of this uh, wonderful uh, session. So I'm really delighted that uh, we are a part of day zero. As mentioned, uh, I will focus on the question sex differences in disease and does it matter? And um, Traditionally, the perception of sex differences in disease has been that uh, we focus on diseases that are only or predominantly occurring in either women or men. Diseases related to sexuality, to reproduction or pregnancy or to the fact that there is lack of equality in access to health care. Uh, however, uh, this uh, traditional um, perception has missed the point that your sex influences your health through the whole body biological actions of uh, uh, your sex chromosomes and your uh, sex hormones. So uh, on this uh, slide, I have uh, an image of the large Y and the smaller, uh, the large X and the smaller Y uh, chromosome. Uh, a healthy woman has two X chromosomes and a healthy man has one X and one Y chromosome among their sex chromosomes. So if we look at the large X chromosome, this holds about 1500 genes that uh, codes for heart and brain and immune function. It also uh, codes for estrogen production, the female hormone that is very Im important in regenerative function in our body. If we then look at the smaller Y chromosome, this holds about 100 genes. This codes for sexual function and production of testosterone, the sex hormone that is also influencing growth and aggression. So just by simply looking at these sex chromosomes, we understand that this is not only about sexual function or reproduction. This is about the heart, the brain, and the immune system. So we need to take a whole body approach. These biological uh, actions, they influence your health throughout your lifespan. As depicted here, it starts already in the fetal part of your life and continues through your childhood, your adulthood, and until you die. In addition, uh, your lifestyle and also environmental factors may influence these biological effects. Let us use heart disease as an example. And this illustration is taken from a paper that we published last year. 
As you can see, it deals with prevalence of major risk factors and special conditions and comorbidities in men and women with ischemic heart disease. If we look here of factors specific for men, erectile dysfunction and androgenetic hair loss. Other factors are specific for women, like pregnancy and lactation, pregnancy-related complications and disorders, menopause, and all types of, of uh, factors associated with reproduction and problems to reproduce. If we go on, we look at factors that are more frequent in men, and I frame this here in the blue frame. As you can see, high blood pressure and smoking and their consequences, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and stroke, are more frequent in men. If we look then on the female side, Factors that are more frequent in women with ischemic heart disease are aging, physical inactivity, complications of having a badly managed high blood pressure for years, depression and anxiety, obesity, diabetes, or presence of any type of autoimmune disease. And in this slide, particularly, we mentioned thyroid disease and rheumatic diseases. Research into these risk factors have revealed that actually women and men develop different variants of the same heart disease. If we look a little further into this uh, complicated slide, high blood pressure and obesity, these burdens your heart. And if you look into a woman with these complications, you will find that she develops a thick and stiff heart. If you look into a man with these um, risk factors, you will see that he develops a dilatation or an enlargement, a growth of the heart, and very often reduced pump function. If you then look at patients with heart attacks, typically, if we look at panel D, this is an X-ray of the uh, uh, artery uh, to the heart in a man with a heart attack. And we see there is this yellow part in the artery. The artery is blocked and this caused the heart attack. So this is the typical mechanism for a heart attack in a man. More than 95% of men has, has this cause of their heart, heart attack. And we have developed wonderful treatment for this kind of heart attack where we unblock the artery. So what is the problem? Well, if we look at women with heart attacks, we are now in panel C. Again, an X-ray of the artery to the heart. And you see that in this woman that indeed had the heart attack, there is no blocked artery. And this is the case for between 20 and 25% of women that have heart attacks. The cause of the heart attack is not a blocked artery. And of course, the wonderful treatment to unblock the artery is not relevant for these women. And the remaining question is, how can we treat these heart attacks? And why do they occur? Finally, another very common type of uh, heart disease, heart failure, that the heart is uh, uh, broken, it cannot really deliver the blood to the body that the body requires. Again, if we look at men here in panel F, you see 
typically this is a male heart with heart failure. This man had previously a heart attack and a part of the muscle died. And we see this very thin wall. This is a scar. There was a loss of muscle mass and the pump function is reduced. And that's why the heart cannot pump all the blood that the, the body requires. And we have many treatments for this kind of heart failure. If we go back to women, we are in panel E. This is the heart of a woman with heart failure. And again, you see the small heart with the thick walls and the stiffness. So this is not a problem of pumping. This is a problem of filling. So obviously two quite different kind of heart failure disease. So um, looking at heart disease in a sex specific approach, we now know that risk factors for heart disease differ in frequency and importance between women and men. And we know that women and men develop different variants of uh, the same heart disease. And the best treatment of uh, the female variant is often unknown. So we need to move from equality in healthcare using men as the gold standard to optimal sex specific personalized healthcare. And this is where we are now. So, uh, chair ladies, ladies and gentlemen, yes, sex differences matter in disease. We need to stop basing management of heart disease in women that I took the example from on research primarily performed in men. Women and men, they develop different variants of the same disease. So it's time for political action. New research is needed to optimize prevention and management of heart disease in women. So thank you very much for your attention. It is then my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Elizabeth Swerd. She is a nurse by training and is the senior research advisor now in an NGO, uh, uh, Norske Kvinner Sanitetsforening. This is the NGO that provides the majority of funding uh, for uh, uh, research on women's health. So please, Elizabeth, we would like to hear from you. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I represent the Norwegian Women's Public Health Association, which is the largest NGO regarding women's health and life conditions in Norway. We are more than 40,000 members and have 600 local branches all over Norway. And this year we celebrate 125 years. Of the history of these years, Norwegian Women's Public Health Associations, we recognize, we highlight and campaigns against inequality in women's healthcare and champions research into the clinical differences between male and female conditions. Today, we include a research portfolio, including 40 projects annually at PhD and postdoc level. This year, we have allocated 25 million Norwegian groans to women's health research, which is far beyond public investments in 2021. Thank you for included, uh, including me for this uh, workshop and conference. And I'm invited to speak of sex and women's health in education of health professionals. Because sex and gender play a significant role in the medical management of patients, it's paramount that these topics must be incorporated into medical research and education. These differences in 
psychology uh, in physiology and pathophysiology between males and females are evident in many disease processes, diagnostic tests and treatment options. In 2003, the Norwegian government created a women's health strategy and initiated several initiatives. Uh, among them, where a center for women's health research was established at Oslo University Hospital. Both Eva and I are part of the reference group there. And Siri is the leader of the center. And new guidelines were drawn for including both genders in research. But there are nevertheless major knowledge gaps and several areas related to women's health do not receive sufficient attention. Are women more ill than men are? And are women affected by other types of diseases? Are women's health subject to fewer studies? We tried to answer the questions in the report, what do we know about women's health in 2018? The report was a collaborative project between Norwegian Women's Public Health Association and Children Gender Research.no and the Norwegian Research Center for Women's Health. The report showed major gender gap in health research regarding women's health, and I'm sure Eva will focus on some of the gaps during the panel discussion. The aim of the report was to create a foundation of an online portal that documents and communicates women's health research and gender differences. This is an initiative to meet needs from medical professionals and policymakers, and to make research available to everyone, to disseminate research and to increase people's ability to develop health literacy. Since the report, the Norwegian Women's Public Health Association had worked for funding on this online portal, but we have not succeeded yet. I will return to this topic during the panel discussion. In the light that the need on more knowledge is increasing and several sex and gender influenced disease presentation and patient management differ, there has been various international initiatives to improve the integrating, integration of these topics into medical education curriculum. Although certain schools may include the topics, their impact on the student, student's body's knowledge has not been fully studied. Our next step from the report, what do we know about women's health in 2018, was to investigate what do the students learn of gender and women's health in Norway. This survey was also by Norwegian Women's Public Health Association in collaboration with Children Gender Research. And our question was, what requirements for knowledge about gender and women's health do we find in the health professional educations? We investigated medicine at NTN Unit Online and University of Oslo nursing at Oslo Met and University in Agder, psychology at University of Bergen and University of Oslo, and learning disability nurses or social workers at Østfold University College and physiotherapy at University of Tromsø. Last spring, we launched the survey Gender and Women's Health in Health Professional Educations a survey and a learning objectives in the education, medicine, nursing, psychology, physiotherapy, and home service. The survey showed that women's health is not mentioned as a separate field of knowledge, not men's health either. The knowledge that the student must acquire appears to be gender neutral, and the regulation of the common framework plan for the health and social sciences education have now been established in the order to ensure equal services for all groups in society, the candidate, 
must have knowledge of inclusion, equality, and non-discrimination, regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and age. Such a gender-neutral formulation is strange, and it indicates that men become the norm. An equal health service across genders means including differences in biology and opening up that different gender roles can affect our health in different ways. Since the framework plan, which has recently been adopted, is intended to be flexible, this should be possible to change, but how? Another challenge for students is how to acquire knowledge in areas where there's lack of research. The educational institutions have great freedom to develop the subjects and decide what the students are to learn. But should it be like this? I will return to this question during the panel discussion. But bear in mind that the survey is based on the framework for the education and is not a systematic review of literature or teaching. But we cannot rule out that the students actually receive instruction, uh, instructions in gender or and in women's health. Uh, we think that the reform is overdue. There are national guidelines that set minimum standards for final competence description for all basic education in health and social sciences. And the fact that these do not include gender perspectives beyond the fact that students should have knowledge in, of inclusion, equality, and so forth, raises a number of questions. We must act to improve the education of future health professionals by imbuing them with the necessary knowledge and skills to deliver sex and gender specific clinical care. But how? Does this mean that teaching in gender and women's health is something that is up to the individual institution and to the individual lecture? We have some reflections. Is it the case that as a woman, I should rather go to a doctor educated at NTNU who has more learning goals related to women's health than to someone who's educated at University of Oslo? We know now the knowledge gaps are many and that the student do not learn enough to close these knowledge gaps or to mind the gap. In 2019, uh, the government announced that they will invest more in women's health in order to be able to provide a better patient service for both sexes as part of the patient health care system. But Norway has not fully succeeded. There is the need on more women's health research and the competence in the education must be strengthened from the start. The Norwegian Women's Public Health Association hope that the educational institutions have access to researchers and professors with expertise in women's health and gender. The need is huge. We must educate tomorrow's healthcare workers with enough tools to ensure correct treatment of the patient. And we must start from the students day one. The government has now called for a new white paper on women's health after many years of political pressure from many, also my organization. We hope that the report will look at the connection between education, research and clinical work and patient care. We hope that gender and women's health must be clearly integrated into the teaching. The policy makers who are crafting tomorrow's health policy must put on their gender spectacles. Thank you.